Casual Diary Podcast, episode 325. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because we are going to do something that we've never done before. We're actually going to talk about a topic, a product type, a type of investment that I can't remember us talking about at least in the last six months, maybe even longer. And I know that there's a number of you who have either emailed in or you asked us questions or you're in the Facebook group and you're like, hey, what about these? And I don't have a whole lot of information to share with you because it's not something I've done. I've explored, I've written offers, but I've not really closed on one. And what's going to be interesting today is that you're not only going to learn a little bit about self-storage, but you're also going to learn a lot of it about why you may want to do certain things a certain way. What do I mean by that? Many of us talk a lot about the whys behind our business, but today we're going to learn someone else's why? And that may inspire you to go out there and do some of the same things. What's interesting today is that we have with us someone who's been practicing real estate for a long time, long time being 15 years, done over $25 million worth of real estate transactions and private loans. She has a passion uh, for financial education for women and children, which I think is awesome and has Help found several financial literacy programs and youth based and a youth based program called the Magic of Money and Cash Flow Divas. Now, you may have heard of her before, but I'm gonna do my best to ask her questions she's never been asked before. So make sure that you listen to none other than Aaliyah Ott. Aaliyah, are you there? I am here. Thank you, Jay, for that warm introduction. Appreciate you're, it. You're quite welcome. I'm glad that you are here. Now, uh, I'm going to say this. Because this is your first time here, I tend to ask everybody the same question the first time that they're here. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So, you know, you've got Wonder Woman, Black Widow. uh, You've got Batman, Robin, Supergirl, all of these people who are superheroes. And I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common because occasionally we can think that we're going around... You know, maybe we're flying around saving customers from themselves and providing our products and services. And maybe we actually think we actually have a cape on our back and that's possible. But also like superheroes, you know, uh, entrepreneurs have a beginning. Superheroes have a beginning. You know, Spider-Man before he was Spider-Man was, well, he was just kind of taking photos, doing his job. So what we would like to know is before you were, you know, serving on the, as a director for corporate philanthropy philanthropy programs, before you did the $25 million worth of real estate transactions, before real estate even was on your radar, we would like to know, who is Aaliyah Ott? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, I guess going back to my childhood, really thinking about entrepreneurship, that was one thing that was a theme throughout my my growing up years was really... um, it was a bit of a hustle. I loved to create little jobs for myself and empower myself to create my own income. I grew up in a family where I had essentially two retired parents. My mom wasn't really of the retirement years, but my dad was. And because he was a former military veteran, my mom was able to be a stay at home mom. So I had basically myself, a dog and two parents at home. (laughs) And, uh, And like probably many people in the stories that they tell, I did grow up on a farm. It was, it was a small farm. It wasn't like animals and chickens and stuff running around, but we had a a lovely garden. And my dad was really inspired to live the life he wanted to live in his retirement years. 
which he was lucky enough to do, which is garden and golf most of the days. So I was exposed to that as a child. And I was probably a little bit of an outlier when it came to where I grew up. I grew up in a small town, believe it or not, called Sweet Home. Um, I can't. Nice. Does it, is, yeah. Now you're going to tell me it's in Alabama. It's not in Alabama. It's actually <laughs> up in Oregon. <laughs> But it was it was a lovely place to grow up. A lot of you know close knit families. Um, you were kind of on two sides of the fence. You were either an environmentalist or a logger, and so I was somewhere in between. I had the business mindset, but I also appreciated nature and growing up, you know, with the woods around me and the mountains kind of in the backdrop. It was a very beautiful place to live, uh, and I knew inherently that there was something bigger for me. I didn't know what it was exactly. Hmm. Uh, As I was going off to college, I was wanting to learn more about film production and being part of that whole Hollywood scene. And I did. I pursued a college degree in film production, realized at the end of it, after going to Sony Studios and being part of that and the internships and everything, that Hollywood wasn't for me at all. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I did almost a 180. I, I don't know if this is exactly opposite of the whole Hollywood scene, but I got into corporate philanthropy. It was a bit of an evolution. There was some commonalities to it. I was doing digital media and, and filming things online and streaming video and whatnot. But I ended up going down this route of corporate philanthropy and really engaging in that whole mindset of supporting good causes that help other people. And I loved that. Hmm. But I also knew that that wasn't the end game for me. I knew that working a job for a nonprofit organization was not going to create financial freedom. So in tandem with All of what I was doing in my day job, I kind of had this night thing going on, you know, the weekend warrior (laughs) sort of throwing on the construction hat, going down to Home Depot, flipping houses, buying rental properties. I did that on this side until I was able to create enough cash flow to leave my job. Got it. So, okay, there's so much in what you just said and i'm just trying to figure out where to even begin because you 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 would definitely be the first person to mention logging like ever uh, <laughs> so i'm just like okay so i was beginning to think that that's how the real estate ideas came into play but then the you just took this what seems to be this wild turn over to corporate philanthropy and i'm just like okay How did, I don't even understand that connection. (laughs) Like, how did you go from A, like, did you just wake up one day and said, I know, I'll help corporations and their money? I mean, I I, I didn't, I don't even, I'm I'm missing something. There wasn't really something magical about it. It was monster.com, really. I, I (laughs) nice. She's like, I I needed to eat. For like three months in between two jobs. And, while I was in Europe, I posted my resume on monster.com hoping to get a job by the time I got back home, which I did. I got hired by Cisco Systems up in San Jose. Mm-hmm. And the job that they had offered to me was in the corporate philanthropy department. So I wasn't pursuing philanthropy per se. I had this set of skills of being a director of digital media and things of that nature. And that's the position that they needed me to fill was basically a program or project manager position for an organization called NetAid. And that was with Cisco Systems. And then it evolved in a partnership between AOL, Cisco, and Yahoo to create Network for Good, which was the organization I worked for for about 10 years. It's an amazing organization. They've done over a billion dollars in online fundraising for charity. And I'm really proud to be, you know, had been a part of that team to been the creation side of such a big organization that's helped literally hundreds of thousands of nonprofit organizations. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now, I, I now that makes a little bit. Now I understand the connection a little bit more. So, was it were you just up late one night and you saw? A, 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 you know, a, a commercial that you can make a lot of money in real estate and you say, Hey, I can do this on the side. It, how did that, how did you get that spark? Where did that come from? It really came early on. I, I remember going to open houses with my mom. It was, you know, we'd be out shopping or something on a Saturday afternoon and I'd see an open house. So I'm like, Oh, let's go take a look at that house. And 
I have the opportunity to kind of go check out different you know, pieces of real estate. I also have the inspiration. My parents had a rental property growing up. Ah. And a lot of a lot of kids were jealous because I would go to Hawaii on vacation. But what they didn't realize was I was going to turn that property over to a new set of tenants. So <laughs> yes. I, I, I could see the ocean, but I was holding a paintbrush in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I could see the ocean, but I couldn't play in it. Yeah, yeah, it, well, you know, once in a while, but really we were there to work. And so we were fixing things and painting and making sure the place was clean. And I knew that real estate was part of my future. I had a little bit of investment sense as a, as a child, as a youth. My parents instilled in me good money habits, um, which I really appreciate. I think that's, again, something that is left out of our education system. And a lot of people, they learn their habits from their parents or by trial and error. And I was just grateful to have parents that taught me how to save, taught me a little bit about investing. And just by demonstration of that one property showed me, hey, real estate's a good thing to own. So I kind of credit that to my parents. But, you know, of course, you've got that purple book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, (laughs) which I picked up early in my 20s and grateful that I did because then I learned the whole cash flow quadrant and really that whole mindset of moving from an employee and self-employed to becoming a business owner and an investor. Got it. Got it. Well, that and that's a perfect lead into exactly my next question, because for for many people, you know, they can find themselves a decent job. We're taught very well how to find a job. We know that process. Um, but you in the in the background of having a job, you were building this other thing. And yet, it, just like every other superhero, there comes a point at which he or she realizes that, hey, I've got a special ability here. And when they realize they've got this special skill, they have to go, wow, am I going to use this for quote unquote good or evil? And, and am I going to go really full time and do this Spider-Man thing? So you had a very similar moment because you, you know, there's a lot of people listening even right now who are in a job or maybe working part time or have the op or thinking in the background. Yeah, I think if real estate could be the way out of this into the transition, however, they may be lacking the courage to actually follow it through. So my question to you is, when you were presented with that reality that, hey, this thing could be a full-time thing, how did you develop the courage to leave the familiar behind? Well, Jay, it it felt like I was on, I was teetering like a little bird that has never flown before on the edge of the nest. And <laughs> I had probably had about six or seven years of investing experience at that point, but in all all honesty, I wanted to have the model where my investments paid for the nonprofit work that I was doing, not the nonprofit work that I was doing paying for my investments. So I had to work through a number of you know challenges during the early 2000s when I started investing to really fine tune my skills on that. And I, I did. I, I got some education. I took a number of classes right after the economy tanked. And I met my business partner in 2009, right at the end of 2009, beginning in 2010. Uh, I then did the 60 day challenge with a a invest club for women, which you may have heard of. I have indeed. I'm sure you have. Hi, Iris. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, Iris. (laughs) Iris. Iris is one of my favorite mentors. And she really got my business partner, Terry and I together through accountability, kicked our butts to the 60 day challenge, learned how to assess properties better. And during that challenge, I got a really great cash flowing property out in Corona. It was a triplex under contract and kept it. Ah, And because of that property, I was able to have enough cash flow coming in, not to completely replace my income, but to replace enough of it where I could pay all my bills. And I had a long enough runway with my savings where I could comfortably take off like an airplane. You know, you're, you're going down the tracks and you have only so far to go before you have to lift off right. and take flight. And that's what I did. Like I was going to say, I felt like this little baby bird at the edge of the nest who's never flown before. I've always had a job. I've always had some sort of safety net. And at some point, you you just got to go. You got to jump. And it's a little bit clumsy at first. It takes a while before you finally get all that air underneath your wings and you can soar like the birds in the sky. 
Yes, indeed, indeed. So I guess then the the question becomes, you know, for a, a lot of people, they they want that they want that experience that you're describing. You know, what would you say contributed to your ability to actually build up enough momentum and have the confidence to go full throttle? It was a number of things. It it was first, it was education. So really understanding the investment opportunities. And I love education, but there's a point at which you have to pull the trigger and start taking action, which is why we named our company Investors in Action. Got it. So, So I was pulling the trigger here and there on different deals, building up my cash flow. Um, I don't think it's wise necessarily for people just to leave their day job and never having any experience and then, you know, not having any savings or anything to fall back on. I think it's wise to develop a little bit of a portfolio before you go full time. So I was I was prioritizing my time. I got rid of the television. I was really focused on making this happen. And especially at that point in the downturn. In 2008, I knew something special was about to happen. It was about to create the biggest opportunity for real estate investors that were prepared. And so I was extremely focused on that preparation point, which is why I took the 60-day challenge and took a bunch of other classes um, and surrounded myself with the right people who could mentor me, who would complement my skill sets like Terry does. You know, she's more of the person that stays behind the scenes and ensures that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed and spreadsheets are perfect. <laughs> we <laughs> need not, those people. <laughs> I, exactly. I could do those skill sets, but my time is better spent networking, creating deals and creating opportunities, raising the capital for the properties that we buy. And so having that partnership was really key because we just kept fueling each other. And I think that's something that also a lot of people miss out on is they they go solo. They try to do everything themselves. And that's not really a smart approach. (laughs) No, no, no. I'll rephrase that for you. Um, It's stupid. Don't do it. (laughs) (laughs) That's what she was wanting to say, but not trying to could was looking for the politically correct way of saying it. Uh, I can say it. Yeah, don't do it that way. All right. So of all the choices that are out there and when we survey the marketplace there's there's a plethora of choices so many so that it can become overwhelming uh, for any one person to to even discern because uh, we always get the well where should i start you know question you've carved out a a, a spot for yourself inside of the whole self storage facility or self storage niche, if you will, uh, when it comes to real estate. Now, before we start talking more about self storage, um, I often tell people that when you're going to begin any business, regardless of the business, you need to answer five questions and you need to answer them in this order. The five questions are none other than why, what, when, who, and how. And chief among them, the reason why your business may or may not be succeeding is because you didn't answer the question of why. So, I ask you, Aaliyah, why self-storage? Okay, so you know that why is one of the important questions. In fact, there are five questions that you should ask anytime you're starting a business. It is why, what, when, who, and how. And when you answer those questions in that order, you'll probably have a better business than if you don't. Again, that was why, what, when, who, and how. Why is the most important question, and it empowers and gives you the strength to do all the others. But what's really key for you to understand is that if you are clear on your why, so will be your team, so will be your capital, so will be your business purpose. It will make it easier for you to go out there, build your business and make things happen. You'll know when to buy, when to sell and why you're selling and why you're buying. It just makes things clear. If you want more tips like this, feel free to pick up a copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. All you got to do is go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Put in your name and email and pick up a copy. You never know. You might learn something. So might I. And it could all be fun. Let's get back to Aaliyah and find out, well, why self-storage? Okay, there's a two-part answer to this question. The first 
why question is why is Aaliyah investing in real estate at all? Okay. And the answer to that is when I was doing a lot of the corporate philanthropy, I really liked being able to support worthy causes. And I realized as an employee, I would never make the mark on the world that I wanted to make that I could, if I had cash flow coming in and I had more time freedom to give to the causes that I cared about. Makes so that sense. was my philosophical why. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Why I chose self-storage, it was, again, a bit of an evolution. I did the rentals. I did the flips. We did private lending. Um, I dabbled in notes for a little bit and got myself out of that as far as non-performing notes. We fell into self-storage, and we fell into it this way. We were doing private loans on fix and flip transactions, and I got a request for a loan on a self-storage property with a friend who I already owned a property with. So um, Al came to me and said, hey, Leah, I need you know a couple hundred thousand dollars to close this transaction that's closing in a few weeks. Can you help me out? And it was one of those moments where Terry and I had already discussed getting into commercial properties. We wanted cash flow that was long term and we wanted an asset that was recession resistant. We had such a good run between 2010 and 2013, 2014 with our lending. We didn't want to get stuck on the other side of the market cycle Mm -hmm. in, in an asset class or in an investment type that had a high level of risk when the market starts to flatten or even go down. So we were looking specifically for an asset class that could weather out an economic storm. And it just, ha- I mean, it's like when you put it out to the world or to the universe and you say, okay, this is what I want to attract. And then all of a sudden it shows up. We just looked at that opportunity and we said, yes, that is it. That is it. That is it. Bell storage. And we continued down that path by funding another deal and another deal to the point where we then got our friends and colleagues involved. We felt very, very comfortable with our other partner, Al, and how he runs his operations. Again, going back to team, you have to have the right people in place that you can trust and complement each other with their skill set. And that's how we ended up. That's the why behind the self-storage. It's just, it's an amazing asset class. I could go on for days about all the reasons why I like self-storage over renting properties. You don't have tenants that squabble. They're boxes and <laughs> they're teddy bears and they're stinky old shoes. I mean, the things that are storage <laughs> units are not the same things that occupy an apartment complex, right? So you, you have quiet tenants, your human tenants that are actually paying the rent. They come in when they drop their things off, and they typically don't come back again until they're ready to retrieve their items. Um, The delinquency process, handling a tenant who is behind on their rent, you can't just go and put a second lock on an apartment or a single-family home. That person has to go back inside their dwelling. But with a storage property, you can just throw a management lock on within days of delinquency and start the auction process if you choose to. So there's there's just so many reasons that I love this asset class. Got it. Excellent. Especially now, I, I have a couple of questions on this because we're going to dig into some of these reasons. Because if we don't, I'm going to get emails, and I don't want them. I want <laughs> I want you to answer the questions now. So when it comes down to it, first of all, let's 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 get a general understanding of the landscape. Where in the country or world are the self storages that you've managed to acquire or partner in? That's a great question as well. So looking at the overall landscape of the United States, you have cap rates, which is an equation between what you're paying for the property and what the net operating income for that property is. And the lower the cap rate, the more money that you're paying for your cash flow. So ideally, as an owner or a buyer, you want the highest cap rates possible. And the highest cap rates possible are found in the middle of the country. They're kind of, you know. Also known as not California. Why was, yeah, not California. (laughs) I just wanted to be clear about that. Not New York City. It's 
if the interior portion and the southern portion of our nation is where you have the higher cap rates. And so that's where we tend to purchase our properties. I wouldn't be opposed to owning property in California, but finding those low cap or the higher cap rates is very challenging. Uh, we're, we're looking at a long-term cash flow play. If you are looking at short-term appreciation, that's why people buy on the coastline, specifically like the Northeast and, and pretty much the whole West Coast. So we buy in the middle of the country. Got it. Excellent. All right. So you, you buy the property. What's involved uh, in, in terms of uh, actual operations? So like what, what does a day in the life of a self-storage owner look like? <laughs> uh, one call to the property manager. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there's a property manager in place very similar to what you would do in single family rentals, yes? Uh, well, I would sometimes people manage their own single family rentals. We we hire property managers to work on site. Okay. Usually we have one full time person and one part time person so that we could have a seven day a week coverage on the property. And that's really important for us because it's a distinguishing factor sometimes in the marketplace. A lot of places aren't always open on on Sundays or Mondays. Um, but if you think about when people are moving and when they need to get into a storage facility, Sunday is a very popular day to move. So uh, that's one of the things that we do. A day in the life of a storage manager, it's actually pretty quiet because maybe you're getting somewhere between 20 to 30 interactions with new tenants per month. It's, you know, if you, if you average that out over 30 days, that's basically one new tenant a day. So it's pretty quiet. Um, we have the property managers focusing on making sure that the property is cleaned up. So they do have several duties on site from behind the scenes. We're really focused on how do we attract as many tenants as possible. And a lot of, what we do is focus on online advertising, which is not something we're buying a lot of properties from mom and pop sellers who own the property since the eighties or nineties. And many of them don't even have a website. Right. And right. we're targeting lower occupancy properties. And the reason why they're low occupancy is because they missed the Google boat. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they're I not understanding that really about half of their potential tenants are coming from an online Google search. And if you're not pulled up in those search results, either through an aggregator that pays for those top three advertising spots, or if you're doing SEO marketing to get up in the, the non-paid rankings, then you're really just not being seen. And that's so important. Indeed, indeed. Now, the the person that's on site, so that I'm clear, is is that an employee of your company, or is this a third party company? That like, so should we be looking for a third party company, or is this a person that we're training internally? Well, for anybody who's listening, there's really two paths that you can take. There are a number of companies out there that will jump in and help you manage a storage property, and. We choose to hire our own employees and train them the way that we want them trained. It reduces our overall cost to do the property management. There's no additional fees that we have to pay a separate company. Uh, but there's there's pros and cons to, to both. I think if you're just getting started and you're a little bit nervous about maybe buying an out-of-state property, hiring a company who's been around the block a number of times and has systems in place is not a bad way to go. Indeed, it makes perfect sense there. So typically, what is that, that, you know, I know that in, you know, certain marketplaces, we can expect to pay a percentage of income uh, for that particular type of service. What does that typically look like for the self storage company that provides these things? Mm. For a company that provides the services, I'm not really sure because we've never hired one. I'm guessing they're probably about 10%. Okay, got maybe, it. Maybe a little bit more because they're providing it depends on if they're on site or if they're just kind of on call. Got it. Um, yeah. So, all right. We, I, I get that the, you know, the tenants are, we'll say relatively quiet. Uh, they don't really move a lot. <laughs> you don't have a lot of inner, you know, day to day operations and whatnot. So let, let's talk about the other side because there's always another side uh, of the story when it comes to self storage. What would you say are some of the challenges when it comes to operating and or owning 
one of these that we we definitely not aware of at the moment. I think one of the greatest challenges that storage property owners in particular have to deal with and have to manage very carefully is the auction process. Because you're auctioning somebody's valuables off, there's a specific process that you have to go through. And every state has its own laws around it. I think there's only two states that don't. So in managing that process, you have to ensure that You're not having your property manager go in and move the items that are inside the unit. They basically have to roll up the door, take a picture. And we like both of the property managers to be present when this happens. One who's recording the whole process and the other one who's actually taking the action of of undoing the lock. And that's for their own security as well as ours to manage that process correctly. We also have to send out delinquency notices to um, to the tenant who's behind in rent. We attempt to locate them, however, they have provided us information for. Um, and then if you know that the person is deployed on military leave, you cannot auction their items off. So if you have an inkling that this person is in the military and they're they're out on duty, uh, you really have to be careful with that type of tenant. So that's where most storage property managers see liability issues is in not handling that auction process correctly. Interesting. And are there any concerns with um, uh, security at at all uh, with some of these facilities? Is that ever a challenge or, or is that relatively simple to handle? You don't want to buy properties in war zone areas for sure, because you could have issues with that. Uh, I think in the years that we, including Al, so he's owned storage properties for almost 10 years. I think we've dealt with one or two break-ins and we have the information on video camera, thankfully. So that's one key thing that you'll want to take a look at is security cameras, making sure you have security cameras in place. If the property we buy doesn't have them, we usually install them within the first six months of ownership. And what else is nice about that is not only can you see what's going on with maybe tenants or people that are, you know, creating some mischief on your property, but you, you can kind of oversee what's going on with your property manager too. (laughs) We, 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 We acquired one property where the weeds were, super high and we you know put it on their list cut the weeds so nice. we went on to the cameras and we saw that the weeds weren't cut and we inquired about the weeds oh yeah that's been taken care of well <laughs> that person didn't have a job very long because they weren't being honest so that's another way to manage your property remotely a lot of these camera systems now are so sophisticated. They have phone apps where you can just look at your smartphone and you can see the different camera views. Indeed, indeed. So what other roles, if any, does technology play in the remote management or management or operation of a storage facility? Well, two things come to mind uh, outside of the SEO marketing that I described earlier. One is your internal system for managing your tenants and your payments. So nowadays, you can have automated payment systems like you would for just about anything else. Uh, where you can set that up in the system and charge a credit card or charge a bank account. Uh, What's beautiful about those systems is at a glance, you can log in, you can see the occupancy levels of the property, who's paid, who hasn't paid your delinquency levels. You can look at a visual map of your entire property and see a color-coded system of what property units are occupied, which ones are delinquent and which ones are empty which is really cool. I'm, I'm a visual person. So mm-hmm. just being able to add a quick little glance, get a visual tour of what's going on on my property is, is wonderful. Got yeah. it. I, that makes sense. That, I, I get that. That makes some sense and can provide some peace of mind and so as well as some comfort being able to have all of these touch points, I guess. Um, l- let me ask this question. Let me ask it this way. Uh, if someone, you've been through many different iterations of investing before, you made it to self-storage. Yeah. So is it the place to start or should they do something different first? I'm pondering that question because if I was to give somebody advice on that, 
I think it depends on the individual. It's an easier type of commercial property to own. Mm -hmm. And if I was to go back and give myself advice, I would tell myself, you don't have to mess with the small stuff. If you're able to raise the capital for something bigger, go to commercial real estate. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. That's important. Somebody was washing dishes, their dog barked, or their kid screamed in their ear. Say that again, please. (laughs) Okay. If I was to go back to my younger self when I was starting real estate, I would have empowered myself to learn more about commercial real estate instead of single family. Because I think within single family, that's a safe place for people to start. And I wouldn't necessarily negate going there, but there's so much more opportunity in commercial real estate, specifically, I love the self-storage arena, that isn't that tricky to do. Mm. A lot of the things that you have to do within the single family arena, there might be a few more systems to set up and you might need to have a more structured partnership. But if you can put that in place, I would go for storage or something like that. I would go into commercial because there's some headaches that you may never experience that you would with a single family home. (laughs) Some headaches? Come on. (laughs) Well, and, and the beautiful thing about it is actually in some ways less risky because you have multiple tenants that are paying for your you know, paying for your mortgage, paying for your expenses, as opposed to relying on one single tenant in a single family house rental. Right, right. Totally understood. Totally understood. So um, let's let's pretend for a second, because it it shouldn't be very difficult. I, I think there's a number of people who have listened this far and are going, I want more. Uh, if nothing else, you've piqued their interest. They're like, well, shoot, if she can do it, I can do it too. Uh, but they they need to find out more information about how this whole thing works or they just want to track you down and figure out, you know, what what more do I need to know in order to make something happen? What's going to be the best way for them to find out more? You can go to investorsinaction.com and we have a section on how to learn about self-storage investing as well as how to invest in self-storage. Quite simple. Love Very it. Very simple. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. So as we end here, I have a final question for you. I think your answer is going to be interesting because I definitely want to hear it. Um, let's pretend for a second, Aaliyah, that someone who's been listening is, you know, standing in front of the superhero outfit store. They're thinking, hmm, I might want to try this whole entrepreneur thing. I'm ready to pick out my cape and tights and, and, and spread my wings and fly, etc. However, in the back of their head is that voice. And I know you know this voice, Aaliyah, you've dealt, you, you, you've dealt with it time and time again. It's that voice that comes up anytime we want to become bigger than our present place. And, and we think that, man, this would be so great if I only could do X, Y, and Z. But that voice occasionally comes up and says things to us like, who are you to do such a thing? And do you really think that's going to work? And for some people, unfortunately or fortunately, they're related to that voice. So my question to you is as follows. With a company like the name Investors in Action, (laughs) I'm curious to know if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the person listening that you would be talking to right now would actually do in the next 24 to 48 hours what you suggested, what would you suggest they do? This is going to be a long pause. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That, that really, tells me you're thinking about it. That's good. I, I like I it. I am thinking about it. I am thinking about it. It really depends on where they are. I would take an assessment of where they are and where they want to be. I would start with the end in mind. What is their ultimate goal that they want to get to? And then I would reverse engineer it. How do I get there? Start asking those questions. The why question, the how question, the who question. Start assembling your plan to create your financial freedom in your future that you really want to live. But start with the end in mind and then work backwards from it. That's what I would do. Excellent. 
And that's all that that's in some cases, that's all somebody needed to hear so that they would have some clear direction to make things happen. I definitely want to say thank you, uh, though, to you for taking the time to to invest your your knowledge, your wisdom, your expertise here with us uh, at the Cashflow Diary. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? It means investorsinaction.com. Why? Because you need to be in action and you want to be an investor. So I'll say again, investorsinaction.com. There's no more need to be waiting. If you've ever thought about self-storage, well, now you know a place to go to become more educated. And more importantly, take some action with some wisdom as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. 